Cognitive therapy is a system of psychotherapy. It consists of a theory and an organized body of principles for applying this theory to the treatment of patients. There are various principles involved in the theory. The major principle is that the way an individual perceives his reality will influence the way he behaves and the way he feels and the way he approaches his problems. Consequently, if he misperceives reality, then he's going to have aberrant feelings, he's going to behave in a maladaptive way, and he's going to have difficulty in solving his problems. Underneath this type of misperception, we often find there are many distorted beliefs. In depression, the beliefs center around a negative bias towards the self. The depressed person perceives himself in a negative way. He sees himself as a loser. As he looks back on his past, he thinks of himself as a failure. The present is filled with predicaments and the future with futility. In contrast, the anxious patient may not see himself in a negative way, but he sees himself as surrounded by dangers, and he believes that he is not able to cope adequately with these dangers. The paranoid patient in contrast, sees himself as the victim of abuse, persecution, intrusion, blockage, frustration, and the like. All of these disorders have a particular type of thinking disorder. First, there is selective abstraction. The individual fastens his attention on a few significant details in a particular situation, but he ignores all of the other details. The depressed patient, for instance, may only perceive those incidents in which he fails or does not live up to his standards, and he misses all of the very positive aspects of a situation. Second, the individual may jump to sweeping conclusions on the basis of minimal or inadequate information or data. Third, the individual tends to overgeneralize. Thus, if he makes a mistake in one situation, he may believe that he mistake, makes mistakes in every situation. Finally, patients in these disorders tend to show all or nothing thinking. For instance, if a depressed patient is not totally successful, he is likely to see himself as a total failure. Now, how do we apply these theoretical principles to the actual therapy situation? Actually, the theory is a kind of a blueprint which we use in order to organize the information that we obtain from the patient. This blueprint helps us to understand the patient better, and it also enables us to select those tech tactics and strategies that will enable us to treat the patient. The main objective in the therapy is to try to adjust the patient's biased thinking in such a way that it conforms in a more regular and accurate way to the actual external reality. Now, there are many techniques that we use in cognitive therapy. First and foremost, it is important to establish a good working relationship with the patient. This is something that we call collaborative empiricism. The patient and the therapist work hand in glove, testing out the patient's belief, evaluating them, seeing whether they're accurate or not, and modifying them according to the requirements of reality. Secondly, the therapist uses questioning in order to unravel the mystery of the patient's problems. This is something that we call guided discovery. The patient and the therapist try to work to ascertain just what the distorted thinking is, and then they attempt to evaluate the distorted thinking. There are many ways in which one can evaluate conclusions that a patient makes which do not seem to conform to reality. First, one can ask, 
What is the evidence for your conclusion? Are you leaving anything out? Are you omitting contradictory evidence? Does your conclusion follow logically from the observations that you have made? And finally, are there alternative explanations that may be more accurate in explaining a particular episode? The ultimate goal, of course, is to correct the patient's misconceptions. Once they are corrected, the depressed patient becomes less depressed, the anxious patient becomes less anxious, and the paranoid patient becomes less paranoid. What do you feel about being here? I'm very nervous. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Uh, my stomach is turning. Uh, I think my palms are starting to perspire a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I am concerned about uh, how well I'll come across mm -hmm. if, uh, if, if I can maintain my uh, faculties to uh, communicate, keep a good conversation going. Now, do you remember having thoughts of that nature? Uh, will I come across well? Will I be able to carry on a conversation? Will I be able to perform properly? Did you recall having had those thoughts? Uh, the closer I, I got to your office, uh -huh. the more severe the thoughts got. And as the thoughts got more severe, what happened to your symptoms? The anxiety, the stomach, the sweaty palms? Um, my, uh, my stomach started to churn more and more. I felt a lump in my throat. Uh, I found it uh, very difficult to breathe. Uh -huh. So in addition to the stomach, you had other physical symptoms, such as a lump in your throat and some problem in breathing. Yes. Now, can you see any connection between these very fearful thoughts that you had and the symptoms that you're experiencing? They, they, they run together. Uh -huh. they, they're just, I'm just, I'm almost like jelly. Yeah. So one of the things we want to look at is to see whether this type of thinking that you do produces the types of effects, both psychologically in terms of the anxiety that you feel and also physically, the uh, funny feelings in your stomach and the sweaty palms and the choking sensation that you get. We want to see if indeed the thinking produces the anxiety symptoms. Now, if the thinking isn't reasonable, if it's way out of line, you can correct the anxiety symptoms by correcting the thinking. For instance, it might very well be that it doesn't matter how you perform here. And if you could be convinced that it doesn't really matter, that it's my job rather than your job, then you wouldn't feel anxious anymore. That would help, yes. Uh-huh. So let's look at it right now and see if it's true. Whose responsibility is it to carry on the interview, yours or mine? Yours. Right. And what's your role? M my role, I'm here to gain knowledge and uh, help me with my anxiety. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm here. Right. And so your role is simply to be able to answer questions and performance or being nervous and so on doesn't at all interfere with giving us information because your nervousness itself is a form of information, isn't it? Yes. So the responsibility isn't on you, is it? No. Right. And the question of evaluation isn't on you either. No. Right. Now, what do you think would be a more reasonable way to put your role in this particular interview? I am to respond to what you ask me, but I also have to be honest with you, because if I'm not honest with you, then you won't be able to feed it back to me. Right. Now, does the anxiety prevent you from being honest? No. So you can be honest whether you're anxious or yes. not? Yes. Honesty has got nothing to do with performing, performing well, carrying on a good conversation, being a polished speaker, and so on. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay, now that we've gone through that and restructured your role, uh, how are you feeling? I feel better. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm, still, uh, I'm still anxious, but, right. but I, I feel more comfortable so, now. Well, you can see when a person changes his thinking from something that's kind of exaggerated, such as I have to perform well, to I just have to do whatever comes my way, you can see when the thinking gets modified, then the emotions do change. So let's see how this develops now in terms of your major problems. Now, what is the reason why you're coming for therapy at this time? I just went through a divorce, mm -hmm. and I'm, uh, I'm depressed, 
and I have a lot of anxiety. Mm -hmm. Now, first, what I'd like to do is look at your depression itself. Is that okay? Yes. So let's, let's examine the depression and see just what it's made up of. Um, now, on what basis do you think uh, you can make the diagnosis that you're depressed? Uh, I, I have that terrible feeling in my stomach that I am just very lonesome mm -hmm. and that I will be alone for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. And at this point in my life, no one wants me. Mm -hmm. Now, it seems that your depression then is made up of the fabric of several conclusions. One is that you're lonesome. Number two is that you're alone now. Three is that you're going to be alone for the rest of your life. And four, that nobody wants you. So this is the way you see your life situation in a very negative way in terms of you and other people. Yes. Now, how do you view yourself? As you look at yourself, do you see yourself in glowing positive terms? I, I feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. And I feel that uh, after the divorce, uh, with, a, with, a new, uh, with a new position, with a new company, that I'm ready to get started in life all over again at, at age 47. But it still does not eliminate the loneliness of mm -hmm. today. So the major thing that seems to bother you is your loneliness. Yes. Now, as you look back on the past, how does your past history seem to you? Stinks. Uh-huh. In what way? you feel your past history stinks? Because uh, I was very lonesome as a child. I had no brothers and sisters. Uh, my parents were alcoholics. I married, made very few friends as a youngster. And I felt that uh, from as far back as I can remember, I, I have always had a shell around myself. I've always kept everyone at arm's length. Mm -hmm. I would never get close to anyone. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, uh, did you feel that you made a success out of life, in, say, the last five or ten years? Uh, I made, when I got married uh, five years ago, I felt it was a tremendous emotional experience for me because I, it was my first marriage, and uh, here was a woman which I felt at the time was the most wonderful woman in the entire world, wanted me. Mm -hmm. And that made me feel very good about myself at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as, uh, now, but now going back through the divorce again, I'm, I'm back uh, having some doubts about myself again. Mm -hmm. And now as you look back on your past, how do you view yourself? I view myself as a product of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't my fault mm -hmm. that I was that way as a, as a right. youngster. And, and how do you feel then this childhood development has affected you, say, in recent years? Uh, as a child, I spent um, my, practically my entire childhood by myself. I received virtually no love as a youngster. Uh, being an only child and my parents drinking a lot, uh, I had no one to communicate to, and there was, there was a lot of fighting in our family uh, with my mother and father, because yeah, I would just hide in the yeah. bedroom. And it, it made me a very, very sheltered person. Yeah. Now, sometimes when people have a childhood like that, they reach certain conclusions about themselves and about other people. What conclusions do you think you have now that may have originated back there? How do you see yourself now? in terms of the childhood experience? After uh, going through some counseling this last year, I feel good about myself now. Mm -hmm. And prior to going through the counseling, how did you feel about yourself? I was a goddamn jerk. Uh-huh. So you regarded yourself as a jerk, and in what ways were you, quote, a jerk at that time? Um, hooray for me and screw the world. Uh-huh. Uh, I had a lot of ang anger in me. I, uh -huh. I looked at, uh, I didn't try to look at the positive side of people. I always looked at their bad side. Mm -hmm. And I was very negative. And I had an attitude of, uh, I'm going to get them before they get me. 
Mm -hmm. So up until you started the counseling, you had a lot of attitudes about other people, yes. which was kind of, sounds kind of competitive, dog eat dog, is that yes. right? What? And it was like, who's superior and who's inferior? Yes. And I'm going to hold people at arm's length. Yes. And at that particular time, the loneliness did not bother you. It, yes, it did bother me. Even so. It bothered me then. I didn't know any better. I didn't know what to do. Mm -hmm. where, where do I go to change, to change into being a good human being? How mm -hmm. do I get started? Mm -hmm. I was very, I've been very lonely all my life, but I, either I was too stupid or I just didn't know what to do to, mm -hmm. to get started on the right track. Yeah. Now, you think that this kind of standoffish attitude that you had, being aloof from other people, uh, set you up for being a lonely person? Like, before you started the counseling, you say, I'm going to step on these people before they step on me. This idea of seeing people as in opposition to you, do you think that that might have affected you in terms of your relationships with other people? Oh, yes, by all means. Yes, I... Um, I can see, you know, just in the last six months, I can see a different attitude uh, of people towards me. When I go to someone and I'll put my hand out and I'll shake their hand, and I'll, and I'll radiate warmth mm -hmm. and love and kindness. Uh, whereas before, it was uh, who's got the strongest grip? Mm -hmm. And don't look me in the eyes, you son of a bitch, because I'll stare you down. Now, how strongly do you feel this other notion? I don't want to hop on it too much, but it does seem to be the core of your depression, as you said, that you've always been lonely, you always will be lonely, nobody wants you, and you're never going to be able to find somebody who will want you. How strongly do you believe that? I don't believe it at all. So you don't really believe it? No. Uh, so on the one hand, you say it, but on the other hand, you don't really <laughs> believe it. <laughs> it's, it's when I'm laying around the, the house by myself, uh -huh. and I have absolutely nothing to do. I've got nobody to call. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm just, it's Saturday afternoon, and I have no date. Uh -huh. And I've got nothing to do, and I just, what am I going to, nobody wants me. I have to start feeling sorry for myself. I see. So when you're actually in an isolated condition then these thoughts come up but right now when you look at these very same thoughts you don't believe them no you don't now let me play the devil's advocate why don't you believe them because I feel now at my age I am I am maturing and I'm becoming a good person and I have something to offer to society and since you are maturing, becoming a good person, and you have something to offer to society, what does this tell us about the probability of you finding somebody that you can be close to? Excellent. So right now, you, are you still feeling depressed? No. I'm, not starting right this to minute. I'm starting to feel better. Okay. Now, what's going to happen when you're lying in bed, it's a Saturday afternoon, it's kind of gray outside, nobody's calling you, you're all alone. What are you going to be thinking then? I, uh, there's a real good chance I'll be depressed. Uh -huh. Very good chance. And you're going to be thinking thoughts like, I'm all alone, I'm always going to be alone, and nobody wants me. Yes. And what are you going to do about it then? I've got to call somebody. Okay, one thing is you can call somebody up. Yes. And what will that, if you call somebody up and that person responds positively, what will that tell you? It tells me that somebody cares for me. That's right. Somebody cares for you. In other words, your belief is wrong. And has that happened, that sometimes you had this belief that nobody cares for you? You called somebody up and you got some positive feedback? Yes. So you've already demonstrated to yourself the belief is wrong. Yes. At times. But one demonstration doesn't do it. One swallow doesn't make a spring, right? You have to keep demonstrating it to yourself. So the next time when you're home alone on Saturday afternoon and you get this belief, you can test it out by calling up somebody. But suppose that person isn't home. What happens? You just go back to lying in bed and... Then I'm, then I'm very hurt. Yes, yeah. that's happened. I'm that's hurt. I'll try calling somebody else. And yes, this has happened. I'll call three or four people. None of them are home. They're all out. Mm -hmm. They're doing something. They're, they're having a good time. Yeah. And I'm sitting at home by myself. Yeah. And so you feel hurt. And what do you think? What thought makes you feel hurt? 
I think that that person doesn't care because they're not home and they didn't call me that day. That's right. First of all, they don't care because if they really cared, they'd be home waiting for your phone call. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. And secondly, if they really, really cared, they would be on that phone calling you. Yes. Now, is there any other reason that they might not call you besides your explanation that they don't care? Is there an alternative explanation why a person might not call you? They're busy with their life. And, and, and they, some of the people that, that I have communicated with over the last year or so feel that uh, you can only support someone for so long and then they have to do it on their own. Or they have to take more initiative. But okay, now let's see. This may be helpful to you because your big problem is these gray Saturday afternoons when you're alone. So could we do a little bit of a role play and let's imagine that um, I'm you, it's Saturday afternoon and I'm kind of lounging in the bed and I'm having these thoughts and then you tell me what my thoughts should be or see if they're incorrect and how you might correct them, okay? Now here I am home all alone <coughs> I don't know. Nobody has called me all day. That's awful. That means nobody cares for me. How are you going to answer that? People do care for you. You have lots of friends. I do. Who, who are some of my friends? I can't think of any right now. Don? Oh. How Jim? Do... Jim? The other Jim? Dennis? Steve, all the guys you play golf with. So it's only Don, Jim, Jim, Dennis, Steve. That's not so many. Is that all? No, we've got two other guys that we play golf with regularly. Yeah, what's their name? Uh, Steve, they give you Steve. and De There's another Dennis in there, too. I know two, I know two Dennises, uh -huh. and I know two Dons, and I know two Jims. Well, if they really cared for me, how come they aren't calling? That's what I asked. Myself, too. You're supposed to. Yes, I know. Right, right. Uh -huh. the, so we, we'll go over that again. If they're not calling, is there any other explanation why they might not call? They're busy with their own lives. Mm -hmm. Right. Now, is that reasonable that they're busy, they have lives of their own, and that if you want to become part of the lives, you have to take the initiative? Is that right? That's what you should do, yes. Mm -hmm. You should take the initiative. Oh. Okay. But I still don't know what to do. I'm lying right here and feel nobody loves me. Nobody's ever going to love me. And uh, maybe I'll go live in a cave and eat worms. Why don't you... Uh, why don't you put on a pair of jeans and a shirt, brush your teeth and comb your hair and take a shower and go down to El Torito? What you're saying is that there are ways in which you could really counteract this negative thinking that you do. Mm -hmm. And you just showed an example of this right now. Now, do you think that it's possible when this occasion comes up again and it's bound to come up again that you can reason with yourself just the way you've been reasoning with me? Yes. Okay, so that's part of what we call cognitive therapy, which is trying to modify people's erroneous views. What, turn, what it turns out is that uh, the views that you have of yourself are erroneous. You do have a lot of friends. I thought from the way you were talking, you didn't have a friend in the world. <laughs> now, I guess if we polled various people, we'd probably find that you have as many male friends as uh, anybody. And you have good times, you play golf with them, yes. and so on. Now, the other part of your problem, though, that seems to bother you is that at the present time, you don't have a woman in your life. Yes. And Evidently, having a woman in your life uh, is very important. To you, having a woman means what? Having a, like a steady girlfriend, someone mm -hmm. I don't have to call up and ask them out right. every week. She'll and, and when you have this woman in your life, uh, what do you think it's going to do to you? It will give me someone to hold and caress, which will make me feel better because mm -hmm. I, I want to express my love now. Am I correct in saying that you seem to believe that having a woman, the way you describe that, means that you're going to be happy? 
I think that is initial step for me uh -huh. to be happy. Yeah. So having a woman means happiness. And not having a woman means unhappiness. That seems to be a formula you operate on. Yes. Well, let's examine this and see if the history shows that. Now, when's the last time you had a woman in your life? During your marriage, I suppose. My marriage, which was, uh, I haven't, Connie and I broke up, uh, it had to be a year ago, about mm -hmm. approximately a year ago. And since that time, uh, when we first broke up or separated, I had an awful lot of dates, mm -hmm. lots of dates. Uh, most of them were one or two dates. And I couldn't find a woman that I found attractive or uh, I felt was uh, socially on my same level. Yeah. So you had a difficult uh, transitional period. Now, how about before you split up with Connie? Well, just like the week before, the month before, what, were you feeling real happy then? No, we, we were going through a counseling that time, and we, about the last year of our marriage, year and a half, uh, we were both pretty unhappy. Uh -huh. So, when, at least we do know, for at least a year and a half, you had a woman in your life and you were unhappy. So, having a woman <laughs> yes. in your life doesn't necessarily equal happiness. Now, let's go back in time and see, there were many years before you were married, and were, were there periods of time before you were married, when you did not have a woman in your life? Yes. And how did you feel then? I felt I was lonesome then. Mm -hmm. Did you feel depressed then? Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. And were there ever any periods when you were neither lonesome nor depressed prior to marriage? Yes. Yes, there were. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, having a woman in your life isn't an absolute necessity in terms of being happy. That's not knocking it right. Yes. We're just saying it's possible to be happy without having a woman in your life. I can, I can be a whole person myself. Right. Without a woman. And being a whole person is really what you have to do. You can't be really dependent on somebody else to make you into a whole person. Let's think about that for a minute. I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I feel I'm on the right track now, for the most part. I feel good about myself. I can be a good person. I am a good person without a mm -hmm. woman, but I miss them. Mm -hmm. Missing them is part of human nature, is to miss something that you want. but. Missing them isn't quite the same thing as feeling that they're so essential to your survival that you can't exist without being depressed in the absence of a woman. Now, what you just seem to tell me is you can be a whole person without having a woman. In fact, you might get there faster without the woman because you can learn to stand in your own feet. Yes. Right. Yes. So, if one of your objectives is to be a whole person, to be independent, to be strong, to be mature, and so on, you might be able to get that without having to make a quick commitment to a woman. I went, uh, after I had all these series of dates, which uh, I just didn't care for over yeah. a period of six months, and in fact, I just quit asking women yeah. out. I just wasn't interested in them anymore because I couldn't find what I was looking for. All of a, one month there, just went, so some period of time, all of a sudden I, I did feel good about myself. I felt good about myself, and I was satisfied sitting home. I wasn't depressed. I wasn't, uh, didn't have a lot of anxiety. I didn't, I didn't feel, feel the need to, to go out and grab the first chick off the street corner or something like that. I did feel good about myself for about a period of a month, uh, maybe two months. And this was right before the holidays, which I was kind of proud about myself, because I was devastated by the fact of going through the holidays with, without, a, without a female friend. I just didn't want to spend. Uh, so I did have a period of about 30 to 60 days there where I just really didn't need anybody at all. But now the last, uh, last 30 days, mm -hmm. the, 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 the old depression feelings, mm -hmm. the anxiety, 
the loneliness that nobody wants me is starting to creep yeah. back into me again. So you're able to overcome that belief that you need a woman in order to exist in a happy way. You really need to overcome it temporarily. Yes. But you no longer believe it, and indeed you were happy. Now, reasonably happy. Yes. Now, if you have the notion that in order to be happy, I have to have a woman, what kind of a position does that put you in? It makes me a dependent on a woman. Right, and it means that if you don't have a woman, that the form is going to have its day, and you're going to be depressed. Mm -hmm. But if you could change the form around to, it would be desirable and nice and enriching to have a woman, but I can be happy without a woman. Then what does that do to you? It makes me a complete person. And when I do meet the woman, eventually, someday, she will respect me more. Right. And so you'll be more independent, in a sense, and you'll be in a more mature level. Now, it may be very, it may be the case, though, that something's happened in the past month that made you slip, because sometimes that happens. Was there anything that's occurred during the past month that may have slid you back into this negative thinking? N no, I, I, I'm just, I just missed the touch. Uh -huh. I want to touch their skin. There wasn't anything? Was there any other relationship that you have that's uh, being threatened? No. Uh, my, my grandmother's dying, but I don't, I don't relate that. To me, that's two different things. Mm -hmm. my, my grandmother raised me for the most part. I was bounced around from one house to another. Uh, my grandmother is in the hospital right now, and we don't think she's going to pull out of it. Mm -hmm. Does uh, that have any effect on you, the fact that... I, even though my grandmother is very close to me, I, uh, I want her to die. She's old. I see. She can't so take care of herself. So the loss of that relationship is not really affecting you now? Uh, no. I, I don't think that has anything to do with my own personal depression or anxiety yeah. at this time. Well, then we'd want to look at one other thing. That is, you said that at times you've gone through these periods of anger. Is that anger still a factor in your life? Uh, some of it is. I'm, I'm still very angry at my wife. Mm -hmm. And um, what's the basis for your anger? What, remember, we had some automatic thoughts that you had that seemed to lead you to feeling anxious, like, how am I going to perform today? It would make you depressed, like, I'm a loser. I'm never going to find somebody. What kind of thoughts do you have in connection with your anger? I'm angry that my wife divorced me. When she divorced me, it took everything away from me mm -hmm. that, that, that I got when we were married. Now, you feel that Connie has taken everything away from you. That's the thought that you get. Yes. She's taken everything away. Let's examine it. Is there anything left? I got the barbecue set. Okay. <laughs> uh, I have material things. We split the furniture 50-50. Mm -hmm. uh, I have embarked on a new career. Uh-huh. How about the children? They're, since they were here, children... Uh, uh, I, am, I am going to... She, she is being very good about that. She has encouraged the children to stay in touch with me and encouraged me to stay in touch with the children. So now as you look at it, is it really true that she took everything away from you? She took away the things that were most important to me. Mainly herself. Pardon? She took away herself. Yes. But she's still allowing you, in fact, encouraging you to have contact with the children. Yes. So it's not a total type no. of takeaway. No. The other thing is you make it sound as though this was something she deliberately did just out of pure cussedness. Do you think that's no. the reason why this happened? No. She did it because she was unhappy. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to be married to me. Yeah. And when people are unhappy, oftentimes they do things that are either damaging to themselves or to other people. And one of the things is we don't want you to do anything that's damaging to yourself because you're unhappy. Have you thought at all of damaging yourself in some way? Yes. I've thought of suicide. Mm -hmm. How often have you thought of that? Uh, it's generally about uh, probably one Saturday afternoon a month. Uh -huh. Okay, now the next Saturday afternoon when you start getting the suicidal thoughts, what are you going to say to yourself? 
I'm going to tell myself that people do care about me. That and they're... You have to name names, right? Yes. You can't just say it in the abstract. Yes. And? Well, I didn't think you wanted all the names, right? No, no. <laughs> but this is just to instruct yourself. Yes. You've got to name names to yourself then. And what else do you have to say to yourself? Uh, that people do like me. People do care about me. They don't want me to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. I have something to offer to society. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so what you have to do is counteract the negative thinking with reality, because none of the things you just told me are untrue. They're all true. But you have something to contribute. Now, the final thing you might just want to consider is that although Connie did take many things out of your life that were present before, she did not take the most essential thing away from you. She did not take you away from you. Yes. Uh, a year from now, or two years from now, I don't know when the time will be after this is all over, and I've got both feet back on the ground again, mm. this will be a tremendously good experience for me. Mm -hmm. I think it'll be a big spirit towards your maturation. Yes. Well, we've covered a lot of territory today. Do you have any questions on any of the things that we touched on? Uh, no, I, 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 I can see myself it, telling myself, convincing myself that uh, when I'm so depressed, because I, 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 I know what it's like to be depressed, and you're, you're sitting there telling yourself, well, gee whiz, I'm really a good person, and uh, gee, I have all these friends and everything. And, and I kind of have doubts about that. Yeah, you mean uh, how it's going to work? How it's going to work, because I, every time uh, I say something, gee whiz, you've got uh, 14 guys you can call and, and shoot the bull with, uh, but, then I'll, th but then I'll hit it back with something negative. Yeah, well, and this is what I was trying to do. So I can't answer all of your negative things in such a short period of time, but I can teach you how to do it. Yes. And what you have to do is get a paper and pencil, probably even before this depressing Saturday comes on, you ought to put down some of these rebuttal statements that we've had just now so you can take them out. And then when you get the counter rebuttals that'll come up, but if they really like me, why don't they call and so on, then you have to be prepared to use the same skill that you showed here today in answering your re-rebuttals. So work on that and see how it, uh, how it progresses. Well, oh, I'd still be interested in one thing before we finish for today. How did you feel about what we covered today? I, f I feel uh, very good about it uh -huh. uh, because uh, I really have not been trying to combat the situation when I get depressed. Mm -hmm. I just kind of lay around the house, watch TV, have a beer, coke, kind of lay around, lay around, wait for, wait till I get sleepy mm -hmm. and then go to bed. Yeah. And hopefully when I wake up the next morning, I'll feel better. Sure. Well, how do you feel now? At the beginning of the interview, you said you were feeling very queasy and anxious, yes. which may have been related to the interview itself, but you also did look rather sad. How do you uh, feel right now? I feel good about myself, and uh, I feel that uh, we could continue this uh, conversation for another hour if we wanted to. Great. Good. Well, thank you for coming in to see okay. me. All right, thank pleasure. you. Okay. Well. Okay. In this interview, I tried to demonstrate how one could apply the blueprint, that is the cognitive model of depression, as a way of understanding the patient's problems and helping him with them. At the very beginning of the interview, I tried to show the patient how his fearful thinking about the interview was leading to his feeling anxiety symptoms, uh, physical symptoms and various psychological symptoms. The patient was able to see, at least, that the negative thinking, the fearful type of thinking that he was experiencing, was related to the anxiety symptoms themselves. This was really important because it meant that the patient could see the connection between cognition and affect, between thinking and symptom. Having demonstrated to the patient that there was some connection between the thinking and the anxiety symptoms, I then moved into a discussion of the patient's depression. The 
patient initially talked about his loneliness, which ultimately he related to kind of a deprived, barren childhood in which nobody really seemed to care for him and which eventually led up into a somewhat aloof, lonely adulthood. This background probably did help the patient to form certain negative beliefs about himself in the outside world. For a large part of his life, he was largely a aware of how the beliefs influenced him, his attitudes towards other people. He lived a kind of dog-eat-dog, dog, highly competitive, dominant, submissive type of relationship with other people. As the result of that, he did not get a great deal of very positive feedback from the people that he had contact with. This type of belief that people have to be kept at arm's length probably prevented him from developing the type of social skills that are necessary for an individual to form some type of permanent bridges with other people. The result of this was that the loneliness got perpetuated. In recent times, however, he has been making some progress in this particular way. And uh, it is very interesting to find uh, that he himself feels that he has matured a great deal ever since he started the counseling. The loneliness, however, for reasons we weren't able to quite establish, had a resurgence approximately a month ago. And he now finds that in particular times, such as Saturday afternoons, when there is nobody around to give him reassurance that he is indeed liked, he falls into certain very fixed beliefs. One of the beliefs is that I have nobody, I don't have any friends. Another belief is nobody cares for me. And a third belief is that I will always be lonely. Now while he's sitting here talking to me, he can see that these beliefs really don't hold much water. However, there's every likelihood that once again when he's alone, there will be a recrudescence of these beliefs. Consequently, I tried to teach him a few skills in dealing with them. These skills won't in themselves annihilate the beliefs, but they will give him some kind of a foothold uh, in order to be able to counteract them. As a way of promoting this type of skill training, I played the role of devil's advocate, and I had him answer me. Now, the chances are that this would not be sufficient for him to be able to rebut the negative thinking when he's in a highly depressed state. But if he does follow through with his homework assignment, which is to write down the rebuttal type statements prior to becoming depressed again, it is likely that he will be able to utilize these to some degree at that particular time. Further, I tried to emphasize the importance of developing this skill, and he did seem to be quite cooperative in that way. The skill of being able to evaluate the validity of his negative thinking, and then, if they seem to be invalid, to come up with a more appropriate interpretation of reality. I also tried to test his assumption or belief that he needs a woman to be happy. This type of belief, unfortunately, becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. If the patient believes that a woman is necessary for his happiness, then when a woman isn't present, he will, as a consequence, start to feel unhappy because that's the way things should be. So I tried to produce some evidence first that there were times in his life when he did not have a woman and he was happy, and secondly, there were times in his life when he did have a woman and he was unhappy. The major thrust of all of this is to try to teach him a greater degree of independence so that having a significant other person is given its due importance but doesn't become a matter of life and death. And speaking of death, I then tried to touch on uh, what is always a potential danger in patients who are depressed, and that is they are likely to be suicidal. And I did give him a few cues as to what to do if he got so depressed that the suicidal wishes would come up again. And basically, the thrust would be to try to undermine the suicidal wishes by looking at the beliefs that are feeding into them, by attenuating or vitiating the hopelessness the suicidal wishes will start to become attenuated themselves. Finally, I did ask him at the end of the interview how he was feeling, and uh, he did say that he felt less depressed. 
it is possible that this may have been a byproduct of the interview itself. Whether the interview was indeed responsible for his feeling depressed or not, at least he does have one thing that he can take home with him. He now has a repertoire of cognitive skills that he can apply at times in the future when he is either depressed, anxious, or angry.